My name is Jason, I'm with BluesOnPC.com, and I'm going to show you how to assemble a computer today. You have to start with decent parts. Choose a case that's good and solid and doesn't warp when you push on the corners. You'll find a lot of cases these days are made of really lightweight tin and steel, and you can bend them without even trying. I'm going to unscrew the side panel. And this will give you access to the interior. And you should remove all the extra screw bags and everything in one go. You'll want to take some time, double check that all the connections are in there the way they should be. You need to make sure that the case actually comes with all the buttons and these sets of wires. I'll try to zoom in on them. There should be a red pair and a green pair and then a blue pair and a orange pair optionally. Once you have two or three of the six popped out, it should be relatively easy to gently pop the entire front plate off. You need to be careful about what hard drives you get. If you get them shipped to you, they need to come in a shipping container similar to this. This helps make sure that there's no hard shock screen to the hard drive. A jarring shock, not an electrical shock. Like when it gets dropped through the miles of UPS or USPS or FedEx sorting containers. Nice shiny hard drive. We prefer Seagate hard drives for what we do. They have had, in our experience, the lowest failure rate of all the hard drives we've tried, Maxter, Western Digital. Hitachi is also a good brand, but we prefer Seagate. We also have preference for the Gigabyte Ultra Durability Motherboards. This is a very good line. that is resistant to temperature changes, resistant to humidity in the air, infiltrating the motherboard. If you look really close, you can see this tiny little edge here. Water infiltrates into that and shorts it out. It can happen really quick, it can happen over time. For the most part, with uh, most applications, it's not that big a deal. But with the more delicate electronics, it becomes a bigger deal. I'll have to take the plate out of the motherboard box, figure out which orientation it goes in, and then pop it in place. Sometimes it takes a little bit of force. Other times it blows and I'm so smoothly you don't think you got it in right. So, you pull your motherboard out of the box after attaching the base plate. I like to maintain uh, the static bag as a resting place for it. I'm working on a carpet table here. Built on the side here, you can't see very much. I apologize for that. I can make 
video later on. I'm tucking the wires out of the way so that here is one spot where I like to cheat. I like to pull this out, place it inside gently, and figure out which sockets are needed for, uh, for the screw hole. That plastic bag we took out earlier. <laughs> contains pretty much all the nuts, bolts, and screws that you need. And really nice ones will even come with retaining straps. In general, I do not apply the retaining, the retaining scraps, straps, simply because at a later date, when we want to modify the computer, the retaining straps will get in the way, and then you have to take a knife, a pliers, or some other cutting instrument inside your computer case while everything is tied down. You can't make it safe. When we use straps, we generally use Velcro straps. Holds in place pretty good. As good as the plastic ones, I think. As long as there's not too much strain on them. And uh, you can just undo it with one hand. Right now I'm screwing these tiny hexagonal nuts, screw nuts, in place. There's probably a better name for them, but I'm a computer technician and I haven't bothered to learn the name for the screws. The screw goes in the screw hole. Somebody not suffering from nerves would probably be about half done by now. leftover bits when you're done. This is normal. But the important thing is to count the holes on the motherboard and count the screws that you put in. In general it's best to hold a motherboard by a solid portion of it. Um, in general I apply the CPU and heat sink for that purpose or hold it by the corners. And we've got all the screw holes matched up. Next step is to apply. So one thing, when you purchase a case, it does not always come. It's not always come with a PSU. The PSU converts your standard household electric into something that the computer can actually use in a variety of 5, 12, and 3 volts. So, just to save on shipping, it's usually easiest and cheapest to purchase a case that comes with a PSU. Always put the PSU in place before you put the motherboard in. It'll save you a lot of time and hassle. Very often, cases are built so tight, you cannot fit the motherboard, the, the power supply unit in after the motherboard is in place. Always, always use these. Now, if you're just doing this at home and you're not interested in overclocking or anything, you can get away with just using the regular gray paste that they put on the heat sink. Myself, I found that uh, we've been having some issues where the gray paste cracks and loses heat sink, uh, heat conductivity. So I'm just going to clean this off. Rubbing alcohol works great for this. Then you have a clean heat sink. We're going to apply a more expensive heat paste. All motherboards are a little different these days, but you've got two primary kinds, the AMD and the Intel series. Uh, there's a few other series besides that. So, most AMDs come with pins, uh, pokey bits that stick out. If it has pins, you have to make sure to pull the lever up and then square up. These holes square up with 
holes in the uh, pin layout on the motherboard. If they don't match, the CPU is not meant for that motherboard. Do not try to force it. You will ruin $100 to $150 worth of equipment. It's really bad. I prefer to use the white, oozier thermal pastes. They are a horrendous mess. Here I am in my black shirt. And it does not take very much at all. This little dab is all the heatsink paste it needs. Uh, maybe about twice that actually. We'll see in just a minute after I'm done laying it out onto the CPU. Some folks prefer to apply it to the heatsink. I prefer to apply it to the CPU so that I don't wind up with the oozy uh, edges and mess. Yeah, I'm taking about a pinhead's worth more of the paste to apply. Do not get the thermal paste on the various portions of the motherboard. This is really bad. You want to clean your hands off after you're done applying the thermal paste, even if you don't think you've got any on it. Again, isopropyl alcohol works great. So, there is the paste job. It doesn't matter that it's not perfectly smooth. Pressure will force it to spread out and even out quite a bit. If you're going with a custom heat sink, read the instructions. It'll save you time and hassle. Heat sinks actually are set to meet up with only certain models of motherboard. There are some heat sinks, some aftermarket heat sinks, that are really nice. And they're designed to meet up with multiple versions. If you've got the time and the tenacity to pull out a screwdriver and swap parts on the heat sink. These heat sinks are designed specifically for overclocking or for low noise. There's, there's a heat sink that's roughly two to three times the size of this one here. Two to three times the size of this heat sink with no fan. Lock in place, flip the toggle, and now we have a solid way to grasp this and maneuver it without risking touching any of the electronic components. You should always clean your hands thoroughly before doing this. I should preface this with that. Your sweat, and you're always sweating, unless you're using aluminum dioxide on your hands. Uh, your sweat will always short stuff out if you're not careful. Double check your orientation. Now, you'll find that that little tiny panel that we put inside of the computer first, that's designed to match up and keep good electrical connection between the case and the motherboard. This is so that if your USB modem gets shocked or your Ethernet cord or your VGA cable gets a shock, it's dissipated harmlessly into the power supply instead of into the sensitive electronic components of the motherboard. This is another reason why you have to use every single screw that the motherboard is designed to take. Now, every single K 
case is different. This case uses this style screw, which is hard to see. Uh, this style screw with a blossomed head. Other cases use other types of screws. If you use the wrong kind of screw, it's not going to work. Or you'll strip the holes. And then you will have all sorts of fun if you ever decide to upgrade your computer. This case here with the power supply is about $80. It is not, it's not a cheap part to replace. So, as I was saying, that little panel that we put in towards the beginning has leaf springs on it. This means that it's always going to be pushing the motherboard just a little bit out of place. So you're going to need to keep maintaining pressure on the motherboard until you get the first screw in. But once you got one screw in, it'll help hold all the other holes lined up with their uh, with their nuts. If you do a lot of computer uh, installation, I recommend investing in a cheap set of uh, screw bits, the kind that are size for this work. Kind of have an extender. In general you won't use the extender that much, but it is very handy when you need it. In the mid-90s, it was uh, very dangerous to have magnets around your computer. It could wipe out your data and such. Now I'm not saying, yeah, store all your magnets in the computer, but a fridge magnet isn't going to harm your computer. Um, using a magnetic screwdriver will help you build the computer faster, and it's not going to harm anything. But if you're going to grab a two-pound horseshoe magnet stick in there, don't do that. You have small enough hands to easily fit inside the computer case. This will make your life easier. If you're like me and have oversized hands, there's a bit of acrobatics getting your hands close enough to the motherboard to hold the screw in place without wobbling. Most cases will come with some plastic bags filled with the screws. I recommend putting the screws back in the plastic bag if you've ever got any leftover pieces. So now we've got the motherboard in, we've got the CPU in, we've got the heatsink on the CPU, and we've changed the paste. Now for memory. using off-brand memory. I've had a fairly high failure rate with off-brand off, uh, off memories. So because of that, I tend to stick with the name brand memories. Corsair, Kingston, and such. That has a few dollars in cost, but I don't have to worry about my clients having their computer, their computer's memory die two or three years after they bought it from me. You will notice memory has a slot just off center. Well, about a half inch off center. That lines up with the slot in the motherboard. If you put it in the wrong direction, it'll rock back and forth. Never force it. It takes about 
10 to 15 pounds of force to push it down and have the latches set. Another thing to be aware of, I'll show this when the computer is upright again. Another thing to be aware of is that the, the memory comes in pairs. I put eight gigabytes in, two four gigabyte sticks. This specific motherboard model is designed with four sockets, so it can go all the way up to, I think, 64 gigabytes of RAM, a lot. Now, it pairs two sets of RAM against the other two. Um, this allows for much faster access speed when they're paired off correctly. You'll normally see the sockets are color-coded. Always fill the same color before moving on to filling the next color. It'll keep your motherboard a little bit faster than normal, uh, unless less access requests coming from, it's a math thing. If you want to understand it better, look up how assembler code is produced. Granted, this math thing only saves a few milliseconds or less, but in general, if you're building a computer like this, you want those few milliseconds. Now the main reason we took the faceplate off earlier was to expose the front. Those cords and wires are important, we'll deal with that later. So, we're going to install several things here. DRW drive actually. And we're also going to install this device. This is a media card reader. Pretty much every single thing in existence uses this device or is capable of using it. The 127 different formats, I forget all the things that it can do because some of the stuff it can do is useless these days. Nobody has electronics that use that format anymore. But most importantly, it lets you use SD, micro SD, uh, XDC, and other things like that from high-end cameras, and the low-end $50 cameras that we all love. It'll even interface with your, your cell phone's SD card. And it provides a third, uh, an extra USB port to the front of the case. Not never something to laugh at. Now, you can install most of this with the plate still in place. I like to remove the plate because if you're installing a lot of things, you'll have a lot of metal brackets to pull out. And oftentimes, the uh, case panels, the plastic panels that protect it, are a bit of a pain to remove also. screws that you use on the motherboard. You don't want to tighten it all the way because you need some, some slop space to shift it forwards or backwards because the panel is going to stick out about a half inch to an inch more than the metal sticks out. I used to think heat sinks for hard drives 
were not useful. Now, in general, as a home consumer, you won't be doing enough hard drive activity to warrant heat sinks for your hard drive. But, if you're doing a lot of activity on hard drive, if, say, you edit videos, or you do a lot of image processing, or rendering, or you work with large quantities of data, you might need to check your hard drive temperature. There's a lovely tool called Crystal Disk Info that will tell you information about your hard drive, the smart health of it, um, SMART, I can't remember the name of it right now, what that means. But uh, generally, you have to, SMART is a self-reporting analysis for hard drives and other things of that ilk. Um, it'll tell you about, uh, Crystal Disk Info in particular, will tell you the temperature the hard drive's at, and other miscellaneous data, including uh, reallocated sector counts, pending sector moves. Um, all hard drives come with some, some filler space that the company doesn't tell you about. And then the, the chips on the hard drive automatically move data around on the hard drive when a sector starts to go bad. Hard drives are pretty freaking awesome. They've been designed for failure so that when they fail, you are not in trouble. Not unless you wait too long. If you find that you have a cautionary light on your hard drive when running Crystal Disk Info, then take a note of what the error is, what's, what's the worry, whether it's temperature or pending sectors or whatever. Call us up and tell us. We can tell you more information about what this means for you. Now we've got the front panel in place, so it's nice and sleek. Um, always be aware of what colors you're getting when you get parts for your computer. I mean, you can get the CD tray in white and maybe the media portion in blue. 
and then you've got white, blue, and black. It doesn't look very comely. So now I'm unlatching the other side so that I can finish screwing everything in place. Now in many instances, people will skip screwing on this side. That's fine. It adds extra support on the off chance you've had an interesting Friday night and you're popping a movie into your computer and maybe you push it in too hard. If you only got two screws in place, it doesn't have as much support, maybe it pops out. That always looks bad. Before you put the panel on the set again, you want to double check and make sure you're not leaving any wires trapped here. It makes life rough trying to get them out. cases come with a case fan, but if they do, it is totally worth it plugging that in. May have to uncoil some wire and such. It can take a few moments to figure out where pins for the system pen are. Sorry, I'm usually looking at this top down. Now that side like this, I'm not seeing that. But that's okay. Anytime you're out of depth with your motherboard, a brand new motherboard comes with a booklet. The booklet will have several different languages. So with this unit, the plug-in for the system fan is to the front instead of back here. Some units have three or four system fan plug-ins. It's nice, but it's not necessary. So, yeah. This cord will not reach. That's okay. It actually came with Molex hookups. So instead of using the system fan port, we instead can just use a Molex hookup. I want to make sure I'm using a Molex hookup that doesn't have a SATA on it, because I prefer all the SATAs to be available for the front of the computer. In your case, these large white or clear white transparent translucent plastic connectors with four sockets are your Molex connectors. PCIe connector. It has six pins. It's this yellow and black cord here. Do not confuse it with the CPU power. CPU power is going to be, again, it'll be black and yellow. But, you see the color difference? PCIe is black. Not always, but usually it's black. 
the CPU connector is that translucent white. And there's two of them for this one because uh, newer, newer processors take more power. So they give it more power availability. Um, a lot of motherboards these days will have a downshift. They'll have an eight sockets, well, eight sockets, and maybe the power supply only has four. Read, read the manual on the, C, on the CPU and on the motherboard. It'll keep you straight on what you can get away with as far as not supplying enough power. Um, this unit you know, we put in here, I think, is a 125 watt CPU, and it needs the extra power. Always feel to make sure you've got it firmly seated. This giant thing here, it's a 20 plus 4 pin connector. Old, old motherboards only have 20 pins. Newer motherboards have 24. This has 24 on its power supply unit and 24 on the motherboard. This is the SATA power connector. It's black. It looks kind of cool compared to the other ones. Just make sure you get the orientation right when you slip it in. Again, it should go in with maybe 5 pounds of force, 10 pounds of force. It should slide in fairly smoothly pushing really hard and it's not going, something is wrong. Maybe you're pushing it in at the wrong angle. Maybe you've got it upside down, but something's wrong. These are SATA data cables, not power cables. They have little metal locks at the tips. It's kind of handy to make sure they don't fall out. Um, some of these, some SATA, ca SATA cables have a lot of trouble with that. Newer computers, are so much easier to build than the ones 10, 15 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, you had to worry a lot about the order in which the cables went in. You had primary master, secondary master, primary slave, secondary slave. So now we've got all the power cables hooked up and the data cables hooked up. This still leaves us with the motherboard control cables. And of course, they're fished back in. I gotta fish them out. So this unit comes with power LED, power switch, reset switch, and HDD LED. And we want to hook all of those up. Again, pull out your roadmap. We're not working with wood, but uh, measure twice, cut once. problems with getting nicer and higher end motherboards, they have a lot more data on how to set them up.
here's the information on the audio headers that I was going to talk about later. And apparently the reason it doesn't have Another nice thing, the more expensive cases, you can get a case and a power supply as cheap as 25, 45 bucks. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing. The cheaper units fail, flimsier metal, and the more expensive units usually have a nice thumb screw that you can handle with your hand instead of having to use a screwdriver. Nice. And that covers it. Thank you for watching. Terribly sorry it wasn't more entertaining. I'll try to work something in better next time. Have a great day.